All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Buyer's Journey Triage, How to Use Data to Map the Needs of Your Buyers. My name is Brian, and we're very excited today to bring you two guest speakers from our digital strategies group, Tyson Stockton and Marlon Glover. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items about the On24 console. An on-demand version of the webinar will be available tomorrow and can be accessed from the same audience link in your email confirmation. Looking at the audience console at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a number of widgets. To ask questions during the webinar, click on the Q&A widget. We will try our best, our best to answer all questions during the webinar. Please note the group chat widget is for pertinent webinar-related info should technical difficulties arise. To expand your slide area, click on the Maximize icon on the top right of the slide area. For common technical issues, please click on the Help widget. Please make sure that your speakers or your system's volume is unmuted. And if you're not seeing the slide transitions, try hitting the Refresh icon in your browser. If you're still experiencing issues, hit Control-Shift-Delete to clear your browser cache and log back into the session. On the left-hand side in the speaker bio section, you'll find links to LinkedIn, as well as our email, should you want to connect with us. In the resources list on your right, we've posted a number of items we think you'll find interesting. And they include a PDF of today's presentation, in case you want to download it, a link if you're interested in a custom demo of the Search Metrics platform, if you're interested in learning more about our digital strategies group, or would like a free consultation, you can click on that link and it'll take you to our website. Lastly, a new blog post has been posted from our Unwrapping the Secrets SEO series that talks about how to use SEO to surface your best content. And finally, you'll see on the right-hand side a Refer a Colleague widget where you can invite a coworker to attend this meeting or view the on-demand version if you find the webinar interesting. Now, on to our guest speakers. Tyson Stockton is our Director of Enterprise Services. Tyson has over 10 years' experience in the digital marketing industry. Prior to joining Search Metrics, Tyson worked on the in-house side of the industry, managing the SEO and SEM efforts of 14 sports specialty e-commerce sites in the U.S., Europe, and Australia. Over the last three years of Search Metrics, Tyson has supported some of the world's largest enterprise websites, including Fortune 500 and global e-commerce leaders. As Director of Enterprise Services, Tyson manages the Enterprise Client Success Team and SEO Consultants at Search Metrics. Marlon Glover is our Content Services Team Lead. Marlon decided a decade and a half ago to pursue a career in the science and psychology of buying decisions. That decision evolved into a career purposefully owning marketing and sales responsibilities. At CEB, which is now Gartner, Marlin co-developed the marketing function for their sales and marketing solutions practice. During the development of the program, he led global awareness, lead generation, and nurturing campaigns for the Challenger sale book and implementation at Fortune 500 and Global 1000 organizations. Prior to joining Search Metrics, Marlon was the Senior Director of Account Management at one of North America's largest content marketing firms, developing and leading content marketing strategies for leading U.S. brands. As the content services team lead, Marlon works with our customers to identify new content opportunities, optimize existing content, and map search queries to customers' buying journeys. And I'm seeing a couple comments that people are still hearing the hold music on top of my um, intro. So if you could do me a favor and log out of the presentation and log back in via the link that was sent this morning, I believe that should correct the issue. But please do let us know if uh, there are still issues with the webinar and we'll try and get them resolved. And now a quick intro about Search Metrics, just in case you're not familiar with us. Search Metrics was established in 2005 and is an SEO and content optimization platform. And I'm saying that if you refresh your screen, it should hear, it should fix the uh, audio issue. 
So search metrics, the core of the product is our research cloud, and we own all of our own data. Research cloud is a data knowledge repository that contains over 250 billion data elements that are continuously updated, like keywords, search topics, social, and PPC data that goes back as far as 2009. We have two products, which are the Search Metrics Content Experience and Search Metrics Suite, the services of a variety of customers, including Fortune 500, Enterprise, and e commerce. The group that Tyson and Marlon hail from in Search Metrics is our Digital Strategies Group. The Digital Strategies Group is an integrated consultancy. Our team of data scientists, strategists, and marketers have been focused with unlocking the mysteries of online performance since our 2005 founding. Our practice spans three disciplines, strategic consulting, where we work with you to create a concrete plan and roadmap to achieve or exceed your growth targets, SEO consulting to improve your website visibility and technical performance, and lastly, content marketing services. And now, I'd like to turn the presentation over to our guest speakers, Tyson and Marlon. Guys, take it away. Thanks, Brian. Um, my name is Tyson Stockton, and as Brian said, I'm the Director of Enterprise Services here at Search Metrics, and I'm joined with my colleague, Marlon Glover, uh, Content Team Lead and Content Evangelist for us. Hello. Good to, good to talk to you today, Tyson, and I'm excited to, to dig into this presentation. All right. So today we're going to be covering um, we're going to be covering the topic of buyer's journey and content. And we're going to be looking at leveraging SEO data to define the map of your buyer's journey, identify the gaps that are at critical stages, and then finding those opportunities to create effective and relevant high-performing content. So really, we're just going to be talking about how to expand the reach and overall um, effectiveness of your marketing efforts to gain more traffic to the site. Um, so before we get into kind of the more tactical tactical levels. Marlon, maybe you can just kind of start us off with a little bit of your perspective and experience on where you see the greatest opportunities for um, different content marketers and where can they further expand the reach of their efforts. Yeah, that's great. And I, and, and I think it's a good place to ground the conversation, Tyson. So um, there's a lot of opportunities in the marketplace and particularly at the pace at which technology is evolving for both consumers and marketers, it's easy for teams across marketing organizations to get caught up in the, in the new shiny thing, if you will, and as a consequence, uh, to become even more siloed than we already are. This is what we're seeing across organizations, and as a result, many companies are, again, trying to figure out how to effectively acquire, teach, and convert customers throughout the buyer's journey. So all of that said, I think the biggest opportunity is the impact that SEO and content alignment can have on the buyer's journey and to create an efficient workflow for it. Absolutely. So, you know, we were chatting the other day and you were bringing up this concept of the buyer's journey. And, you know, I'm familiar with more kind of traditional marketing references like buying cycles and things like that, which, you know, conceptually seems like it fits kind of on this. But maybe you can give us more of kind of like a general understanding of what is this buyer's journey and how that relates to your content efforts. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think, again, this is a great point to cover pretty quickly because I believe it's been covered quite a bit over the past eight years or so. So the buyer's journey is the path and more specifically the moment within that path that a potential customer takes between their due diligence to solve a problem and their purchase decision. Simply put, so eight years ago, the idea that buyers were more than halfway through this journey before they interacted with a supplier was a fairly new idea. There were a lot of credible sales and marketing research firms. They were presenting new findings around this. Uh, this process, you probably, you know, on the phone, you may have seen this, this big arrow uh, in, in some conferences over the past few years. Uh, they were sharing how customers have become more equipped to learn on their own without a salesperson due to advances in technology and they were doing this online. Uh, more specifically, this helped really create the demand and urgency for developing content. The, the big problem with this is, and where most companies tend to, to focus their efforts, uh, they overwhelmingly place their resources at the later stages of the sales funnel. And this isn't necessarily a terrible place to start. However, if this is your, <laughs> your content strategy 
to more specifically your data-driven content strategy begins and ends, then we're missing a huge opportunity. So uh, I like to show this this slide, uh, particularly kind of the uh, you know this slide, maybe a bit more detail in some of my conversations that I'm having with clients. Uh, but even taking this a bit further, what I've been sharing a lot more recently, if you imagine that, that arrow kind of rotating along its, its axis uh, and adding a new dimension, then we can see the opportunity to reach and teach potential customers at each stage. So by really understanding the questions and searches that are being asked earlier, we're able to kind of help define the requirements that a buyer needs and deems as necessary when they're selecting a solution. So what folks that are, you know, logged into the webinar, if they're looking at the screen right now, what they're seeing is along the y-axis, they're seeing the, the, the reach, potential reach of potential buyers. Um, and then along this buyer's journey, as you go along the x-axis, you're seeing the different stages and the places that content can play a significant role in reaching uh, and teaching new uh, potential customers. And, and, and then what I'll say is the, the last point that I'll make is uh, we can't set it and forget it. Uh, we should be revisiting uh, our late-stage content as well, uh, using really smart tools and technology out there that are available to us to ensure that you know, we're still meeting the demand of potential buyers that haven't learned from us earlier in the process. So while it is important to make sure we're covering the entire journey, uh, we can't just create these product pages, these category pages, branded pages, and think that they're going to perform throughout the life cycle of our business. We need to go back and, and take a look at that and make sure we're refreshing it on an ongoing basis. Excellent. And I feel like just in my own experience that this understanding has, has definitely been increasing over the last, you know, eight, five years. And you have more and more companies that will be kind of supplementing their traditional kind of like uh, shopping path pages with more editorial content to reach, to extend the reach of these real relative topics. But I feel like it's great to see that people are extending that, but I still find that there's still gaps that are existing kind of in the middle that are fracturing that experience. And I think that's, that's really what I'd like to get into today too, is getting on a more tactical application level is what are the steps that I need to do to accomplish this? And what does my process look like to ensure that I'm not having these gaps and these fracture points? Yeah, that's great. Um, and, and I saw a question, and, and just know you guys can continue to ask questions in the webinar. We will be addressing competition in the marketplace. That's very much a part of, uh, you know, this, this entire process and workflow. Excellent. So maybe what we can transition into is let's take this concept and let's, let's apply it to a real life situation or even kind of in this case a uh, hypothetical. Um, you know, so we're we're today and we're talking about like upcoming trips that, you know, each of us were gonna be going on and I was talking about how I was interested in kind of finding like a a kind of unusual like weekend spot. You know, I wanted to uh take my girlfriend for a weekend, find kind of something that's not your standard hotel. Um, yes, I, and I think more specifically, <laughs> you mentioned taking a unique vacation, and um, you, you, you talked about renting a treehouse. Um, <laughs> that part is true. So, yeah, like I was interested, and I want to, I want to go on kind of a more something a little more unique. So, rather than kind of getting right to the point of like, okay, tree houses, I can rent for tree house. You know, I know how to, you know, pull the different SEO levers to do it. But what does that journey look like of someone that's either maybe not decided that a treehouse vacation is what they want, or maybe someone that's like kind of going through that? So we'll, let's just start to kind of put put this into action. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it was great. And from that conversation, um, even with only a little bit of information, I was able to kind of start mapping out what one path could look like within this journey of actually renting a, a treehouse as part of your vacation. Um, so I'm thinking in terms of if I'm a travel booking company and I want to drive potential uh, travelers to, to my page, uh, what specific questions might I be asking from the point that, I, that you've decided that you want to take a vacation uh, to the point that you actually booked that? Uh, so uh, you know, even starting uh, the first question, a few terms that you just mentioned, unique vacations, uh, all the way from unique vacations to treehouse vacation experiences to reviews to planning and booking your trip. Um, those were some of the high-level topics that I thought made the most sense 
But what's going to be important is how do we put data, how do we put real tangible, uh, you know, data and metrics to those to, to one, uh, make sure that we're effectively mapping out this process. So um, let's talk about what that process looks like, right? So, you know, we, 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 we kind of thought about those high level topics. The first step in building out this contact, content strategy for this journey is that uh, we, one of five things we need to do. I want to identify the questions and search terms that relate to the overall outcome. In this case, it's booking a treehouse uh, tree house rental. Um, how might I get a potential traveler to book a rental on my site? Two, once I've identified uh, the relevant questions, I want to confirm where they fit into the buying process. And this is part of this validation piece. I want to make sure that I'm mapping the, these keywords based off of some really smart data and metrics to the different stages throughout that buyer's journey so I can make sure that we're fully covering that entire process. Third, based on several factors, things like search volume, competition, seasonality, I can begin prioritizing what needs to be created or optimized. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that there's a lot that we can talk about there, so we'll try to cover this as, as efficiently and effectively as we can within the time constraints that we have. Uh, and and uh, fourth is measuring the performance of this content and making sure that the changes that we make are based on uh, really smart performance metrics. And lastly is refreshing and optimizing this. Again, as I mentioned before, you can't just set it and forget it. We want to make sure that we're refreshing this content as needed, particularly my evergreen pieces and product and category pages. Excellent. So digging into kind of this, the first step, and I I find sometimes like the first step can be sometimes like the most challenging because it's where do I start? You know, it's like I know that or I have the assumption that maybe I'm not capturing the full buyer's journey, but if it comes down to actually putting this into action and identifying these, how do I, how do I know exactly where to begin? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think it begins with uh, – you know, I'm going to say this, and it's going to sound really simple, but most of us know our audience, right? I mean, we don't need to know, we don't need to go as deep in terms of uh, developing in-depth buyer personas with some of the tools that we have. Um, but I think it just really, under, it really takes, a, we need to take a really smart look at, at our audience and understanding who our target buyers are. Uh, so we want to look at the extreme. What are the top questions that we're going to be asking at the very beginning stages of this journey? And what are the last few questions that we want to ask or that potential customer asking at the, the very later stages of the journey. And then we want to be doing some, uh, some very standard keyword research to find opportunities within those parameters. And then lastly, we want to look at some of the competitive performance and, and use that data and analysis to identify gaps. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, and in particular, I like, I like defining or at least kind of starting with a structure as far as like this is the range that I'm working within. And of course, like that range might expand out or contract mm -hmm. in as we get into like validation. But I really like the idea of being able to kind of like set parameters so then I know the world and the space that I'm living in. So then I can just go about kind of visualizing as I'm filling in those pieces. Mm -hmm. And then I can start to get clues kind of where there might be more potential gaps. Right. Great. So let's, let's see this in practice. Um, you know, we're going to use search metrics, content experience suite, of course. Uh, and what I like about this and what's so great about this is that we're able to do everything within a single platform and a single tool. So I wanted to see if there was any demand for treehouse rentals. Uh, and using the research cloud within the content experience suite, I was able to find that there were roughly 4,500 searches per month for this particular topic. And I'm also beginning to see how potential travelers are narrowing those requirements uh, based off of this particular search term. And so with search volumes for, uh, you know, we're able to take a look at search volumes for what do we see here, um, rentals in Ohio. Um, people are looking specifically for, uh, for rental opportunities in the U.S. and Texas and California. So those are following closely behind, and I'm able to get a lot of information uh, beyond this initial kind of keyword research in terms of what my specific audience is, is looking for. Yeah, and what I, what I really like, too, is, I mean, it, it seems like a smaller feature, but being able to sort these by search volume, I'm able to cluster these other kind of, like, modifiers to the phrase, so things like vacation or location, and these attributes that are going alongside, because then this immediately gives me a clue as far as, like, 
the topic of treehouse rentals or treehouse um, getaways, things like that, has this relationship to vacation. So vacation can be a component of my early stage uh, steps in this buyer's journey. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the other thing that's great about this, and um, uh, what I've been showing a lot of clients with this keyword clustering feature is you can even add in modifiers, question modifiers like what, how, should, to identify questions that are specifically being asked in, in, in search engines as most people are starting to search based off of, you know, normal language that they use in the real world. Yeah, and I think, I think most people, especially from like the SEO um, perspective, are very familiar with this more kind of traditional keyword research. But, you know, I know that we want to also advocate, you know, using a variety of, like, methods to really make sure that we have full coverage. So it's like I would view this then as being kind of like your starting kind of point that we already have. We know our audience, so we knew typical phrases, unique vacations, treehouse rentals, treehouse vacations, and I'm able to put kind of KPIs behind that. But then also being able to leverage other tools to expand out even further and really to begin to understand these topics and to be thinking more of like a topic or a cluster of topics for the given points rather than just individual keywords. So what we're doing here is, uh, would you say, and, and just for the folks that aren't familiar, um, within the uh, Search Metrics Content Experience Suite, um, this is an area that we like to use called Topic Explorer, which allows us to do exactly what you just described, Tyson is developing a comprehensive view of a specific topic so that we are making sure that we're covering it comprehensively. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, it's, and I, I really like to how you're able to see the relationships between the topics by knowing how far apart they are and how, knowing how much separation there is in these concepts, we can begin to see which things we can cluster together. And, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's been a point that's been kind of like, driven home with a lot of people that it's like we're not looking at one keyword, one page. So we're looking at how we can extend the reach of those individual pages to make sure that we're getting the most out of them. This is great because I love to give my writers a lot of direction around, um, you know, what we should be focusing on and then give them some free reigns to, to kind of be creative and create engaging content within these bigger topics. So this is extremely helpful for me and, and kind of my day-to-day -day work. And then, in addition to kind of understanding using more traditional keyword research, more sophisticated measures like Topic Explorer, but always like looking at the competitors and knowing the competitors is, again, it's kind of a staple for general keyword research, but I think there's a direct application here as well. Yeah, so let's talk about this. Um, and, and we're still at this point where we are trying to understand if the, uh, you know, what topics and what search terms we should be going after. And we also can use, and you're, you're saying that we can use kind of competitive analysis to fill gaps within our own content strategy. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. So, like, for this, this URL that we have up on the screen here is a general page that's talking about treehouse rentals. Mm -hmm. It's not specific to a location, being that it's just kind of very general. I wouldn't say it's at the beginning stage. I would say it's kind of somewhere in the middle. But then I'm able to just take this individual URL and then I'm able to look into, okay, what keywords is that URL ranking for? And then how am I able to identify maybe some additional topics or some additional areas that either I'm not covering or that I want to make sure that I'm addressing in either a missing page or just an underperforming page? Okay, that's great. So just to kind of reiterate what you just communicated, if I'm looking to drive rentals for bookings for my treehouse rental, I might look to TripAdvisor using our research cloud within uh, the Search Metrics Content Experience Suite. Uh, I would look at that and I would try to determine uh, what terms are they ranking for that I hadn't considered. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Great. And then, so from here we're seeing, you know, what keywords are ranking for the page, but then we can start combining other types of competitors and we can as we see what they're ranking for, we can potentially start to identify gaps of even our competitors, which could be additional opportunities for us as far as maybe they have a generic treehouse page, but they don't have a page that's specific to a location. For this example, that actually has great coverage on a location or a region, Northern California, but maybe this, this URL doesn't have that general or more broad um, topic that we just saw prior. 
That's great. Yeah, it looks like, oh, wow. Yeah, it looks like Glamping Hub, they do a great job at uh, local and local search results uh, for, for tree houses. Yeah, and something else, too, that jumped out to me looking at this list is although this is a page that's specific to a region, Northern California, it is ranking for Redwood Tree House. Mm. That, I mean, even though Redwood is, you know, a tree found in Northern California, that could be a topic that I'm thinking, oh, that's an idea, something that maybe I want to include, because even though this regional page it's ranking on that, maybe I can expand Redwood Tree into being its own little niche topic earlier on. So when we think about where this applies in the buyer's journey, we've gone from unique vacations to treehouse rentals to treehouse rentals in California, and now we've even gone as far as looking at treehouse tree house rentals in California that are within a specific within a specific location. So this is actually really cool. And then and now we're getting into that point of purchase, which mm -hmm. is really where you want to be leading the user. And to kind of just reiterate back to it, I mean, you mentioned before glamping. It's like when I was originally thinking about this and wanting to go on this kind of somewhat bizarre uh, weekend vacation, um, I didn't even really think of the term glamping. And then by looking at this graph and seeing the size of that circle, I know that there is a substantial search volume in glamping California, and then that's something that is directly relevant to this. Someone that could search glamping doesn't even maybe know they want to see in the treehouse, but here I've just identified something that I hadn't even thought of before. That's great. So, yeah, so we've gone pretty far into that journey, and we've identified that the right keywords and the right search terms that we want to go after within that journey. So, uh, at this point, Tyson, uh, what I, now that I've identified the specific topics, I want to, again, kind of map these to the different stages within the, val the, the buyer's journey. So validating really depends on our industry. So let's take this pull up from the treehouse journey, and let's think about this from a broader approach. Validating really depends on our industry. It depends on the products and services that we're offering. Um, we can look at topics as a whole to make sure it's truly relevant for our solution, um, given some of the processes that we went through that we spoke to just now, but even some of the things that we're going to talk to next. Um, and most importantly, I want to understand where the topics fall within, uh, again, within the different stages of, of this journey. Anything else to add there? And for me, validation, it's almost like a 1.2 step. Yeah. Right? It's like it, it ties back to the first one because more than likely what's going to happen is as you're going into this validation and gathering these different KPIs that we'll use for prioritization, um, you might find other things either giving you evidence of where it should fit in the buyer's journey or also giving you clues and ideas of different things that you can further expand on that maybe you hadn't touched on when we first started the mapping part. Yeah, and, and I specifically, and, and what we're getting to here is, um, uh, again, I'm really looking at ways as a content marketer, how can I give my writers the best guidance for creating this content? So even a bit of direction in terms of the intent of the content that we're writing and where we should be driving prospective customers to. Is it a high-level piece of content, which is more informational, or is it uh, something that's going to be further uh, down, the, down the pipeline uh, or down the sales funnel that we should be driving folks towards more of a transactional uh, interaction as well? So what are we looking at here? Yeah, so here we're looking at the topic explorer again, and why we want to kind of show this visual is to the as you map out uh, different kind of points in the buyer's journey, some of those points could actually be captured on the same page. And by doing and having this as a step in this validation, you're able to more efficiently decide, okay, um, treehouse resort, treehouse vacation, like all these things are very similar related and very, the intent behind these are very much aligned. So you can capture all these topics within one URL and have better performance than you might by having five URLs that you're spreading your different SEO signals to to have a more effective strategy. So within Topic Explore, which is kind of just this, this, um, these bubbles that we're looking at right now, um, there's a key here that, that really shows us kind of where these topics fit within. Um, they match semantically, um, whether they match uh, based off of intent-driven focus, um, so again, kind of addressing what what is what are search engines deeming as a need behind the topics that um, that we're researching, 
and then even more so uh, where they fall within the different stages of the funnel as well. Yeah, and, and we actually just got a, a question in from Chris, and he's saying, when qualifying the needs of customers at each stage, do these speakers organize the needs of customers using a spreadsheet, or how do they process? What variables do they consider, and how uh, do they direct um, based on intent? And that's, that's really exactly what we're doing with. I think putting this into an Excel format and is probably what I would do just because I like to build and manipulate it. But as we're going through this validation, we're also gathering KPIs and metrics that we're going to be using later. So having like a clear organization of those pieces that you're gathering is then just going to make it that much easier to help prioritization. So we're talking here, we're speaking more of kind of like clustering them together, but then we're also able to validate things like the search volume, the intent behind it, and, and those other KPIs, keyword difficulty, and things that are going to help us know what the order of importance is going to be on content production or optimization. Yeah, and even on a more granular level. So, uh, you know, as I'm, looking at, as I'm looking at this from a content strategist perspective or even a writer's perspective, uh, this view, what we're looking at here is still within the, the suite, um, allows me to look at a specific topic and to understand um, the data behind it, uh, whether it's seasonality, whether it's kind of uh, uh, an awareness piece that we should be focusing on, or if it's a transactional type of piece where we should be driving folks down to uh, booking the rental uh, after teaching them about, well, in this particular case, is unique vacation ideas. Yeah, and I, I really like, too, that we're, we're validating as well within these KCIs that are shown the stage of the sales funnel. So we know that unique vacation ideas is an awareness piece where if we look at um, treehouse vacation rentals, now we're getting into consideration. We haven't specified a location or a specific um, like rental property that we're looking at, so we're still exploring it. And I also really like the point that you said on seasonality because it's good to capture what the average monthly search volume, but if there's huge volatility or kind of fluctuations of search volume, that could prioritize what, where we are in the year and what's coming up. So if we know that in July and August are the most searched months for treehouse vacations, we want to make sure that we're starting our content production well before that so the pages can be uh, completed, published, indexed, crawled, possibly even re-optimized before we hit those peak months. Yeah, and, and so that's another great point, and this is why I love having an SEO guy right beside me uh, when I'm developing content marketing strategy. So at this point, Dyson, I could, I could use some more help from maybe even my analytics teams and my SEO teams. And one thing I'd like to know is based on the topics that I plan to cover, how well are we performing against them how might, how might we go about answering that? Absolutely. Um, so again, I, I love that question earlier on kind of like where are you, where are you capturing and keeping record of it. Um, I like the idea personally of Excel because you can easily manipulate little things around. But really you're taking all those KPIs that you attributed to the different stages of the buyer's journey. And then now we're able to see, okay, where is my current coverage? So I know the topics that I want to be ranking for, the types of keywords that I want to be ranking for. I'm able then to track, um, like within our SEO suite, where are my pages performing or where are my page, competitors' pages performing. And in that way, I can determine if one area, maybe I have a page for it, but it's not present at all, but there's a really high search volume, maybe there's more value in re-optimizing and getting that page to rank higher rather than starting with a new topic that could still be important, but maybe it doesn't have as much volume to really like drive the same impact to the business as this page that's existing but just not well optimized. Yeah, this is going to be really helpful for helping, uh, really helpful for managing resources on the content marketing side. So there's a lot of low-hanging low hanging fruit, if you will, uh, across our content coverage. And so sometimes it's really difficult for us to prioritize what we should be creating versus what we should be optimizing. So based on where we are in this journey right now, we've identified the process um, that our target audience are, um, that they're taking uh, that leads to our solution. Um, we map those different keywords and search terms to the different stages of that funnel. And now we want to take a look at 
uh, how we want to optimize those pages and prioritize those pages. Let's talk a bit more about that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, what we, I think we've already covered it before we can begin prioritizing, we want to look at several factors. Yeah, so I think really everything that we've kind of hit on before, those are all going to be elements that I'm going to take into consideration. I'm going to look at the overall demand and opportunity of it. I'm going to want to know what I'm currently capturing and how much of that opportunity I'm already capturing. I want to know the seasonality, the keyword difficulty, which stage of the buyer's journey is that. Of course, your point of purchase is going to be kind of like your absolute critical piece, but then making sure that each of these, and then also maybe like the earlier stages, does that feed into multiple buyer's journeys? So then you're able to kind of capture more than one path with one group of pages or one topic that you're introducing. Yeah, I like that. And even with that type of guidance, um, you know, as a, as a content marketer, I'm thinking about some of my lead nurturing strategies as well and ensuring that, that, uh, that we're addressing those. So this is great. So what are we looking at now? Am I currently addressing, uh, answering questions in the buyer's journey? Yeah, and so, the, I mean, this is the same, the same idea. It's, it's where am I currently performing? Using those metrics to then set the prioritization and then really move into the actual content creation or optimization. And then ideally, too, putting data behind that. Yeah, yeah, this is where a lot of this comes to life and, and uh, a big reason why a lot of companies work with search metrics and particularly the content experience suite. Um, we take all of this data and all of this information and we really got our writers with the right approach to creating content. Uh, based off of the, the really a lot of the hard work that we've done so far. Um, it's all within one pool and it allows the writers the, the, the capability to, to truly uh, map their content to the right keywords and search terms that align to our buyers' needs. Yeah, and from my side, being a little bit just more on kind of like the analytical mindset, I love that we're able to actually put something quantifiable to a qualitative initiative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like typically uh, content production was here's a group of keywords right towards this, but we didn't really know how well it was addressing the SEO kind of uh, quality of the content. Where this, I'm actually able to put a number to it and then come back to either the writers and um, or even kind of like content manager and say like, hey, these are the gaps that I'm seeing from a technical um, analytical side. That's great. Yeah, I'm an evangelist where data is not the enemy of creativity and this really brings help. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we went through, we mapped, we validated, we prioritized, we moved into production. What do I do now? Yeah, so it's, it's critical that we look into our internal tools to understand how we're performing against our KPIs and our engagement metrics. So, uh, you know, this, this could really be a, a separate session all in and of itself. Because then we get into attribution models. We look at, um, you know, we're talking about things like omni-channel uh, visibility in terms of our digital marketing activities as a whole contribution to to revenue. Um, but I think at, at a you know at a general sense, we want to make sure that we're still using our internal tools like Google Analytics, Adobe Analytics, to make sure that our content is still engaging and is doing what it needs to do beyond driving folks to the site. And then we're also leveraging our external tools. So you can use search metrics. You can use some of the other technologies out there, but make sure that we're, we're leveraging some of the best practices and understanding and attributing the content that we're writing to um, its, its visibility on the digital, in the digital market. Like, yeah, and just, I guess, one more kind of like piece that I always want to take the opportunity to kind of like reiterating on is the value add of using multiple data sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I want people to be using their internal pieces because that's like your ultimate kind of like source of truth as far as like this is my business impact that I'm capturing today or what I've captured in the past. But then you also don't want to lose sight of those leading indicators. So I want to look at different uh, external sources to see the full picture. If I move from position on page five to page three, I'm not going to see that yet in my analytics but I am going to be able to register that in ranking data, and then I'm able to know, okay, I am making an impact here. I need to throttle up these levers and these signals that I'm sending search engines to further capture it so I get to that later kind of actual result. Yeah, no, I love it. And so I think, again, with like these reports, it can be a lot of KPIs to look into, 
So the more that you're able to automate and compile into like dashboards is really helpful because more than likely, depending on the size of business, you could have multiple buyer's journeys that you're working on developing for. So having dashboards that's going to give you kind of this is my performance at the different stages. These are my performance from a high level on individual uh, tracks or buyer's journeys. The more that you're able to automate that, the more that you're able to actually get to some of these other action items that's going to actually be the change. You don't want to spend too much time just on the reporting because that, you know, that's not going to change your performance. It's just going to be a tool to get clarity on what's going on. That's great, and this is good guidance for me as well as we uh, as we develop uh, content marketing strategies for a lot of organizations. Is this dashboard? This is coming from our uh, our uh, SEO suite. Is that correct? Yeah, this this is an example of a, a content cycle dashboard. I mean, the cycle very similar to how what we're talking on, but it's kind of touching to the point of reiterating and refreshes the content and seeing how that changes over time. And I think. That is an important piece to just kind of reiterate on is once we get to the reporting piece or we went through, we created content, the job isn't necessarily done. And it can be viewed in a couple different ways. One, in the sense that maybe we're not reaching that actual like business impact yet. So we've moved from five to three, but we're still not getting traffic. And what we know by watching different websites and how they perform in different search engines is we know that search engines um, reward and like the refreshing or reoptimization of content. And in this in this screenshot, I really love like this visual because it you can see kind of what this company is doing and also how a search engine is responding to that. So we have kind of like three touch points. Uh, where changes were made to an individual URL. We have the initial one, pages created, you know, we see it kind of grow in performance, and then we see it kind of stabilize and has a lull. This then indicates a timing period where it's like we want to refresh that content to then have another. We see the spike, we see a little bit of volatility, it falls kind of back down a little bit. We're still above where we were before, but it kind of dropped back down. So then it kind of signals, hey, one more iteration, we have further improvement to do. And then we really see the later part of this where there's then more true stabilization. You don't see the volatility that we saw earlier in the graph. And it's sending a signal to a search engine that this page means something to you. You're not just putting it up one time and forgetting about it. You're wanting to reiterate on it to provide a better user experience. Now, this is great. And this is a great business case for content marketers to keep our jobs. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Um, and then, so I mean, we kind of we went through the steps as far as um, this is how you go about approaching the buyer's journey. Um, kind of just giving us a summary again of what we talked on. Yeah, yeah, no, this is great. So just to summarize what we went through again, we, we identified the questions and search terms that related to the problem we solved for our target customers. We used keyword research and competitive analysis. We map those keywords to the stages in the buyer's journey. Uh, third, we prioritize that content based on factors related to our buyers. It might include seasonality, the amount of competition in the marketplace, so on and so forth. Fourth, we measure the performance of that content and we make adjustments to our strategy and to some extent our content on an ongoing basis. And that touches on the last point is we are re-optimizing this content so that we're providing the most relevant and timely information that aligns to our target customers' needs. Um, so the re-optimization part is something that is going to be really critical for us as we've been creating content for several years now. So we may want to go back and look at some of the pieces that have performed well in the past and figure out ways to, to repurpose that content or to update it so that it better aligns to the market. Perfect. Um, so that concludes the presentation portion. Um, we do have a little bit more time, so we got some questions um, as we're going through these slides that we'd like to just kind of revisit um, with the last time that we have available. Um, so first question that we have is from Brittany, and her question is, if your client is in a very niche space, does the process change? Oftentimes, the buyer's journey topics contain keywords with little to no search volume. If there's no search volume, what's the next step? This is an excellent question. Um, and 
in, in some ways, there, there's going to be some open-ended parts of this answer. Um, so from my perspective, if I'm going through this process and I'm identifying a lot of topics with no search volume, one, I'd want to know where they fit into the buyer's journey. Like if there is no search volume at your point of purchase part, that is potentially a pretty big red flag. It could be in the sense that it's long tail and you need to look at um, more of that a wide range of keywords because each individual keyword is going to have a low search volume, but if you cluster them together, it could be something that's still business value or it could be potentially a red flag. If it's no search volume and it's very early in the buying stage, to me, that's a bit of a question of is it the right topic then? Because as you move up in the journey or earlier in the journey, you should also see broader topics where in our example, our kind of end point was a specific treehouse rental. Um, and then when we went earlier, it was in a region, in a just the general concept of treehouse rental. And then it was into like unique vacation. Mm -hmm. So I'd want to first just kind of identify where it is. And then also I'd look into if I can cluster low search volume keywords to make it a more interesting opportunity. No, I think that's exactly right. I think, um, you know, to, to Tyson's point, we're looking at both the bottom of the funnel and the top of the funnel. And if we can't answer those questions, um, then, you know, we there's definitely some red flags there. So uh, I think you answered that. Great. Cool. Uh, we, got, we got another one um, which came earlier in the conversation from Bill. Um, this question, and hopefully we answered part of this already, but there's one piece I would like to touch on. Um, the question was, how do you map segment keywords and audiences along the buyer's journey? Um, so that piece, hopefully we kind of touched on that more. But the next part of the question is, how much is a manual process versus automated? For instance, some keywords might be broad and could fall into initial buying stage, but might not necessarily, i.e. treehouse experience. This, um, this is a great question. So it, it kind of falls into two areas from my understanding of it. The first piece um, that I'd like to touch on is the manual process versus automated. This is an excellent question that I love because it gets to uh, scalability and working with larger websites that are not looking at individual one-offs. So one piece that could be done to help and automate it, and I guess the, the short -term answer is some of it is going to have a manual element, um, but there are ways to supplement that with automation. So by using things like uh, API calls for ranking keywords on a list of URLs, so if you know the different URLs for your competitors, you can run it through an API call and then use different sorting features within Excel or other software to then boil it down. So then when you're touching the human part, you're looking at a much smaller set. You can do that in the forms of getting uh, attributes on a keyword or topic level. You can run API calls for some of the different features really that we even touched on within the search metrics platform. Um, so that would be one way I'd be thinking of like automation is what, how can I get tap into larger data sets to extract it out that then I can filter down and refine. Um, the next piece of that is talking about things that might and might not. Uh, treehouse experience. This one I'd want to look into intent more. I think for the concept, this falls into the validation phase as well because we're kind of attributing um, does it fit into our buyer's journey, does it not fit into our buyer's journey. Um, something like treehouse experience, my kind of gut feeling on it would be like, yeah, there's still some relevancy there, but I'd want to validate that through that kind of uh, that step and that second step in particular in our process. Um, next one we have, um, let's do one more. Um, looks like we got a question from Ryan on how often should content be refreshed? <laughs> You, you want to take a shot or you want me to take a shot on this? Um, it, I'll throw out a number. You want a number? Let's do it. Let's do three months. Three months. Okay. okay. Three months. I think um, I think that's really helpful to put <laughs> something like that in place because then it sets kind of expectations. Yep. What I would also do is I want to kind of combine a general rule with something that's a little more specific to how your website's responding to the changes and the content that you're putting on. 
Um, so like we saw on that earlier slide where we saw a website and when they had different durations and they were seeing when that stabilization occurs. Um, this little bit of a manual, but if you're kind of building out the right dashboards and the right pieces, you might be able to get kind of signals and um, reminders and signs of, hey, it might be worth moving it up or it might be worth waiting longer. So I think that comes back directly to the reporting elements and knowing how your website's responding to these changes. And also, again, more reason to not just use one source of data to be able to look at those leading variables because then that's going to be a better signal of when you need to change the content. Yeah, and I, and I joke when we say three months, but when we go back and look at some of the, the analytics and the, um, and, and the reporting for um, our clients, uh, I think typically what we see is that between that three, three to six month period uh, is where a lot of the content, you know, some of the content that we're creating, some of the topical content can be refreshed, particularly ones that are more timely. Maybe that, that time frame is a little bit longer for some of the evergreen pieces that are later in the, later in the funnel. And I think that, that about wraps, uh, does it for us. We, uh, we want to thank you guys for listening in. Um, really appreciate talking to you today, Tyson. Hope really we can do this again <laughs> and continue this conversation in a part two session. But I will toss it back over to Brian to wrap it up for us. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, we're going to have to connect after this meeting as, as I really now want to stay in the treehouse for my next vacation. So we need to talk a little bit after. Um, for everybody in the audience, we'll send out an email tomorrow to let you know when the on-demand version is available. If you're interested in speaking more with Marlon, Tyson, or anyone else from our digital strategies group, we'll also include a link in that email where you can request a free consultation. Thank you for joining today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar, and we'll see you next time. Have a great day.